What we're going to be looking at this morning uh, is this passage under the title of Our New Identity. Um, I'm pretty sure you've seen uh, programs that are sort of makeover programs, changing rooms and all this sort of thing, uh, where, you know, how, how, how they can take you and make you look 10 years younger, all that sort of stuff. It's the, it's the stuff of daytime television, I believe. Mm. Uh, but, you know, you've got the sort of before and after thing. And, of course, you look so much better after than you did before. And in a sense, what we're going to be looking at, how God gives us a spiritual makeover. But it's uh, much more than just surface steep. This is from the inside out and changes absolutely everything for our good forever. Uh, so that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning as we look at our new identity. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him, his excellencies, the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, that's the before bit, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy what we're going to be looking at this morning very simply is what you were what you are what you say and what you do because the change from what we were to what we are shows in what we say and in what we do so what we were First of all, we were not a people. Bunch of nobodies, if you like. We were not a people. And of course, the, the language that Peter is picking up here reflects the language of Hosea chapter 1. You might remember uh, the story of Hosea. He was a prophet, but he didn't just have to preach a message. He had to live the message. And in Hosea chapter 1, we read about how Hosea was told to go and marry a woman who would be unfaithful to him. Just like God's people, God's bride, Israel, had been unfaithful to him. And he would have children of unfaithfulness. One of them was to be called after a disaster. Another was to be called not loved. And the third was to be called not my people, because almost certainly the child was not Hosea's. He had this dreadful ministry to live out, where he not only preached a faithful message, but had to feel the very feelings of God for an unfaithful people, buying back his own unfaithful wife for himself. You see, being a prophet was never easy, and it was always more than words. But what Peter is picking up is the fulfillment of that, where God had said to his people, in the place where it was said, you are not my people, you will now be called my people. And the fulfillment is not just that this would be true of Israel, but would be true of all sorts of spiritual nobodies from all of the nations of the earth who had no right to be called God's people at all, that we, that you, that I, most of us not Jews by birth, should be called God's people. Once you were not a people. Secondly, he says, once you had not received mercy. In other words, we were rightly under the judgment of God because each one of us has not loved the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And that's only the summary of the law. You think about just about any one of the commandments. If we haven't broken them in fact, we've broken them in our minds. Every single one of us were under God's right judgment. In fact, the way Paul puts it is that we were children of wrath. We were born rightly deserving God's judgment. At one point, we had not received mercy. 
But then something happened. What are we now? Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't that good news? That God has taken a bunch of nobodies like us to make him God's people. You know, I, I think that's tremendously good news because if God can make something of us, he can make somebody something of anybody. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's why he chose Israel in the first place. Not because they were the brightest and best. They were a bunch of nobodies. But God chose them, though they were insignificant to be his people, to show that there's hope for the world. And God has made us, who were no people, to be his people. So if anyone else is here who's not yet a Christian, there's hope for you too. You can come along with us. You've got no more or no less right to be a child of God than we have. But he takes people who are no people, a bunch of nobodies, to be his people. And he has had mercy on us. We're going to see how the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, came and was rejected by human people. He was put on a cross and killed, bearing our punishment, in fact, so that God could rightly be merciful to us. And we believe that as Christians. Our only hope is not in ourselves or even in our faith. It's in Jesus who has taken our place, showing that God wants to be merciful. And because we've trusted him, we have received mercy. What we are. You are now a chosen people. Not because we're choice, the pick of the bunch, but because God has chosen us. A, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now, the language that Peter is using here is very clearly an echo of Exodus chapter 19, where as the people of Israel came to the Mount of Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and all the rest of it, these words were spoken of them. And now Peter is saying, Peter, who once said, well, I've I've never eaten any unclean thing. And I, I, he was a good kosher Jew, you remember, in the story in Acts? He, he would never have, actually at that point, have spent time with people who were from any of the other nations. Now he is writing to the exiles of the dispersion, to people who are scattered all over the, uh, the Roman Empire. People like us. People who had no right to be called the people of God. But he's now saying, just like Israel of old, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Isn't that tremendous? That we have been brought in to the same privilege as God's privileged people Israel on an equal footing through Christ. How does it happen? Well, very simply, we have this new identity as we come to him. That's verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. God gave us his son, rejected by humans, but demonstrated to be his chosen and precious cornerstone. And what happens is that when we come and line up with Jesus, we're built in to be a, a spiritual household, to be able to be this holy priesthood, to be able to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. You've got to get the picture. The idea of the cornerstone was that they would cut out a very precise square stone. Well, cube, really. Square all round. That makes it a cube, doesn't it, Derek? Yeah. So nice and straight, right angles and all the rest of it. Not like the way they build our houses. 
You know, uh, if, if you try and measure the angles in your house, you will almost certainly find that they are not straightforward 90 degrees. They're roughly that, but they're wiggly. It, when they were building a big building, though, what they would do is made sure that they made a very precise cornerstone, put that down first, and then lined everything up to that so that the building worked straight. That's the idea. And Jesus is God's perfect cornerstone, given to be just right, rejected by human beings, sent to the cross, but demonstrated to be God's son in power by resurrection from the dead. He is God's right one. And if we line up with him, we are in the right place. That's the picture. You see, the, the Bible says, see, I, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's the idea. If we line up with him, we're in the right place and we are put right. So they will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, our translation puts it. And that's true. He's very valuable to us. But I think the translation would be even more accurate if it said, now to you who believe is honor. Because that's what quite literally it says. In other words, when we line up with him, we are put into the place of receiving what he deserves. To you who believe is honor. That's why you'll never be put to shame. You see how it works. The scripture is being applied. But to those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or even the capstone, the head of the corner. A cornerstone, capstone, the, the final bit in the arch that holds it together. I'm pretty sure what the Bible is doing is taking these pictures and putting them together to see the one who really matters is Jesus. Line up with him, you're in the right place. But if we don't, it says, he is also a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And if we stumble over Jesus, then there is no other safe place. In other words, Jesus will either make us or break us. Our response to Jesus is the most important one that we can possibly make. Because either we line up with him to you who believe his honor, he'll make us. But if we won't, then we'll trip over him. And there is no other place of safety. There is only judgment. Because we're sinners. God's provided a way and Jesus is the one who will either make us or break us. So how does this show, this new identity, which is all tied up with our relationship with Jesus, the crucified one, the one who was rejected by human beings, but chosen by God? If we'll line up with him, we receive his new identity, which may mean that we're rejected by other people, but we're chosen by God. How does it work out in our lives? Well, in two ways, in what we say and in what we do. Let's look at how Peter brings out this one first. But you are a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What we say is about him. Now, so often we think that the gospel is about us. And in a real sense, it is good news that he's saved us, he's forgiven us, uh, we've received mercy. Uh, he's called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's true. But the gospel is that Jesus has done it. And he's done it through human rejection and God's acceptance. In a sense, our salvation is the fruit of the gospel that Jesus is Lord. That's the good news. 
That's what we want to declare. And what we want to do is to declare the praises of him, quite literally the excellencies of him. It's all about him. As we come to him, we are built in to become this holy priesthood, royal priesthood, holy nation. He's done it. It's his doing. But we're wanting to make an awful lot of him, not just about us. And we do that in two ways. We do it in what we call worship. Worship is declaring the praises of him. We come here and that's why we sing songs that tell the great things about him, who he is, what he has done, his excellencies. That's worship. We're declaring his praises. But also, that's what we do in witness. We're not saying, you know, come and join Aldwick Baptist Church because we're the nicest bunch of people around here and you ought to come and... No, no. we're saying, look, we have discovered someone who can make something out of nothing because he did it in the creation of the world. Who can make somebody out of nobody because he's, he's made something with us. We are not the bee's knees. We're a bunch of ordinary people that God has chosen to make something of for his glory. God's at work here. This is his building site. Jesus is the cornerstone. We're being built in as living stones, all sorts of weird shapes, though we are, but being built in to be his living household. And anybody is welcome here. You might find that, feel that you're the, the greatest oddball who doesn't fit in anywhere. Well, I can tell you, there is a space that's just perfect for you here. Because he is the master builder who is not only able to take nicely shaped stones. But I don't know if you've ever been up to the Lake District or up to Scotland and you've seen what we call in Scotland dry stained dikes. Yeah? All sorts of odd shaped stones but laid together with such precision that they stand. Well, God's an even builder, better builder than that. And he takes us and fits us and makes us not just as inanimate objects but as living stones being built in to him. That's what we're declaring. The praises of him who called us out of darkness. That's our witness. That's what we want people to know about, that Jesus, who has got every right to break us, wants to make us, if we'll just come to him. Our worship and our witness are actually the same thing. You know, our whole lives are intended to be worship, declaring the praises of him. And what we do on a Sunday when we come together is we have a practice session. Yeah, this is it, isn't it? This is, this, is, this, is, this is team time. This is training time where we do all the things and we sing the song so that we're out with that song singing in our hearts. And actually during the week we're singing that and we're telling people what we've discovered about Jesus. This is team time. Now this is, but the real match is out there. This is where we learn together what God wants us to be so that we are who we are and do what we do and say what we do out there. We practice together so that we can live this life for his glory all of our days. What we say and in what we do. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. You see, sin is not just bad, it's bad for us. So, don't do it. At least if we're wise, we won't. Abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the nations, quite literally, that though they accuse you of doing wrong and they probably will. You know, today, people are going to say, Christians, their moral standards, they're outdated, passe, gone. They're going to say all sorts of things about us if we say the Bible is God's living word. But it's also his unchanging word because the Lord does not change. He has designed us to live in a certain way and people 
will say, oh, that, that, that's old-fashioned. No, it's not. God is not the great has-been. He is the great I am. And his word stays. And if we line up with him, we will be called all sorts of names. Of course we will. And we might even feel that they prick us like that egg. But Jesus will not break us. And he can keep us, even though we feel very vulnerable, he can keep us. Not as the superheroes, but as the ones who'd line up under the cross, taking the shame that he got, the rejection that he got, and in weakness, still living in the power of the resurrection so that people will see even though they accuse us of all sorts of things they will see the good things we do and glorify God on the day he visits you see witness is not just words actions often speak louder than words but actions without words are not going to be understood we need to make sure that people know it's about him. He's the one that makes the difference. Otherwise, they might think the message was something different. We've got to make sure our lives and our words are in harmony, which is often being humble enough to say when we got it wrong and to say sorry and to show people that we know we need to be forgiven we hadn't received mercy and we wouldn't want to be in that place again. But now we have received mercy and we love mercy. So we want to be merciful to others too. What we say and what we do. It goes on and you'll discover more as you go on into the, the, the passage. Submitting for the Lord's sake to all of the right institutions. We have been given a new identity. It's an identity that shows in our thumbprint, if you like. But it's an identity that's marked with the cross. Because we are now his people lined up with Jesus. That's who we are. That's the reality. It's not a superficial makeover. It's a remaking from the inside out. So be what you are. It's nothing like what you were. It's a complete change, but it needs to show in what we say and in what we do. It can't happen unless we've had this transformation. There's no point in just saying, oh, right, I'll say the right things and I'll do the right things. You can't. None of us can. But when we've been given our new identity in Christ through coming to him, then the reality works out. That's how he does it. What's your identity? Who are you? Who are you really? I know. You know, I, I can see my identity in lots of ways. You know, I'm a, I'm a Scot, I'm British and all that sort of stuff. But what really matters is that I am in Christ. And in Christ alone, my hope is found. We're going to sing a song uh, which picks up these themes. Christ, the cornerstone. He's the one. Because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand, if we can, and sing this great song. <laughs>